General Manpital. Crossroads of nearly a thousand lives. A sanctuary, a haven, an edifice dedicated to the needs of those whose mathematical health is threatened. Dr. Practice, Dr. Malpractice, we're about to double an area. Please report to my area on the double. You say your patient has water on the knee? That's right. What are you going to do? Wear a slicker so I don't get splashed. There's a lot of water on the knee? Eight feet at the deep end. Eight feet? Hmm. That is terrible. Well, not really. There's a lifeguard on duty till 10. Dr. Practice, am I glad to see you? I have no idea. About what? Whether you're glad to see me or not. A rectangle was admitted. We need to double its area. Mm, who's in charge of the case? That's just it. Our intern is in charge. Not that nerdy student, Dr. Precisely. Dr. Precisely. I don't think he's qualified to handle the procedure. Well, that's why I called you, Dr. Practice. Mm, you did the right thing. This time. Thank you, Doctor. I'm trying. Me, you're telling. Oh, they're in OR. Or? Operating room. Is the patient anesthetized, Dr. Sleep? Out like a light. Good, because the first part of this operation hurts like a son of a gun. Did you bring the extra parts? Right here, Dr. Precisely. Did you get them from the organ donor? I couldn't find an organ donor, so I got them from a piano donor. That was upright of you. No, it was grand. Never mind, it's a good tale, so we can always spin it. <laughs> Are you Dr. Precisely? Not exactly. You're not exactly precisely? No, I'm not exactly a doctor. I'm a student intern, but I play a doctor on TV. Close enough. Now, show me what you're about to do. He's about to double this patient's area. Ah, and what is your patient's size, Dr. Precisely? It is exactly... two feet wide by five feet long. And now, what is its area? That's the stuff in the middle. I know that, but what is the area and how did you determine it? To find my patient's area, I merely multiplied the length times the width. See, five times two is ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. See, ten one-foot squares. Uh, I am impressed. Perhaps I've misjudged you, Dr. Precisely. You're not as stupid as everyone says. Oh, you've been talking to Mom again. What we're going to do next is take this hammer and knock the rectangle all apart. Yeah, that's what these boards are for. We're going to use them to double the length and double the width. I take it back. I take it all back. You are exactly what everyone says precisely. Let's go to a diagram, shall we? This is a drawing of your patient. It is two feet by five feet. Yes, and to find the area, I multiply two times five, and I got 10. Now, Dr. Precisely, show me what you're about to do. I will double it thusly. I will make it twice as wide, four feet instead of two, and twice as long, ten feet instead of five. Now, there we go, kids. Now, will the area double as well? You would think so. I... Oh, I see what Dr. Malpractice is driving at. Look, Dr. Precisely, the area more than doubles. It quadruples. What? Let me see that. Four times ten is forty. Yikes. It's supposed to be twenty. You see, you've made your rectangle too large. To double an area, you need only double one of the dimensions. You can double the length, or you can double the width, but not both. Oh, sure. I get it. Look at this. We can double the width from two to four, and keep the length the same. Four times five is 20. Exactly. Or we can double the length and keep the width the same. Five becomes 10 times two is 20. <laughs> of course, the rectangle would be so large, you probably wouldn't get it out of OR. <laughs> or? Operating room. Or we could do it yet another way. We could change the width to one and the length to 20. That would really be unwieldy. I'll say. Besides, what would you be able to do with a 20-foot-tall rectangle? <laughs> Send it to Shape College on a basketball scholarship. 
Thank you, Dr. Practice. Call me Mal. Thank you, Mal Practice. I guess I'll be seeing you in court. <laughs> And so, once again, common sense and geometry have solved another problem at General Mathbital, crossroads of nearly 1,000 lives. Until next time, stay healthy and may the math be with you. Take me out to the world. Oh, wow. This is so great. <laughs> Hi, sports fans. Get up, get up. It's the seventh inning stretch. <laughs> Of course, I've got nothing to stretch. Except my mind. <laughs> and maybe yours. It's a heck of a ball game, huh? These days, though, the game sometimes has more statistics than strikeouts or stolen bases. <laughs> hey, don't get me wrong. Oh, gosh, I love stats. No, really. <laughs> but sometimes an announcer will hit you with a stat like... How many runs a player with green eyes scores on rainy nights under the lights on artificial turf when he's got a bandit on his thumb and his mother is watching? Give me a break, please. But I did hear a stat today that got me thinking. It was about southpaws. Southpaws. You know, left-handed pitchers. My team, the Expos, has a bunch, bunch of them. Of the ten pitchers, five are southpaws. So, okay, okay, I th thought... Which hand did they use to sign those humongous paychecks? <laughs> Whoops! <laughs> so, okay, okay, I thought. If half of the Expos pitchers are lefties, does that mean that half of the world's population is left-handed? I checked it out. Sure, plenty of you are lefties, but more of you are righties. Way, way more! Turns out the Expos pitchers aren't really representative of the whole population. <laughs> Only about one in ten humans are left-handed. That's 10%. Doesn't sound like much. But just because the righties are a big majority, it doesn't mean the left-handed minority is peanuts. No, no, no way! You see, the world population is about, oh, 5.3 billion. I knew that. 10% of that is 530 million. So that makes five. 130 million lefties, whoa! That's more than twice the population of the United States. Hey, you can find out if the stats for your class fit the big picture. Take a survey. Figure out the percentage of lefties. Now remember, the bigger the sample, the closer the percentage will probably be to the world average. The real small group would not be very likely to match the 10% world average. <laughs> Take a look at the last four presidents. Three of them, Ford, Reagan, Bush, are southpaws. That's 75% of the sample. Those guys may lean to the right, but they're all left-handed. <laughs> oh, time to get back to the game. Now that we've stretched our minds. <laughs> hey, we've got a lefty at the plate. Know who batted lefty? The Babe. Here's the pitch. The batter swings, hits a long fly ball deep down the left field line. That ball is here! Yeah! Right on! I mean... Yeah! Left on! The story you are about to see is a fib, but it's short. The names are made up, but the problems are real. It was Thursday, 9.43 a.m., and New Yorkers were celebrating Give a Taxi a Break Week in the Big Apple. The idea was, simply, when a rider got out of a taxi, he kept slamming the door until the taxi broke. I was working the day watch out of MathNet. The boss is Joe Greco. My partner is George Frankly. My name is Tuesday. I'm a mathematician. We were deeply involved in a mystery about the music business. It was showbiz to the max, and we decided to scan scenes from earlier shows to refresh our thinkers. We met a record producer who thought her company might be cheating in the music business. Uh, how much do you know about this company? Off the record, we know it was a monster company 20 to 25 years ago. And then it fell on hard times? Very hard times. The music business changed a lot, but off it didn't change with it. What happened? Carol told us that the company started putting out what she called bad sounds, and they began to sell millions of copies. Carol thought the president of the company, Morris Norris, might be bribing jocks to hype the records an illegal scam called payola. We checked it out and Benny said it couldn't happen. We asked why, always a good question. Say that because of a conversation I had with Hot Rocks. 
He told me something interesting. DJs couldn't take payola anymore, even if they wanted to. Why not? Music committees. A while ago, almost all top 40 stations went to what they call play committees. Play committees? Boy, some people have a meeting about anything. It's a group of 48 people who select a list of music to be played on that station. We decided payola was not the answer and rolled it out. To get more facts, George and I disguised ourselves as a new group and went undercover. It was there we met. This is our esteemed president, Mr. Morris Norris. Mr. Norris, meet the Googles. The what? Googles. I'm Sister Google. This is... Brother Google. Morris was considered a genius because he had had seven mega hits in a row. He showed us how he did it. And I can show you how to improve your sound. Turn it on, DeVelvis. <clears throat> Sir? You know, uh, make it play music. Fortunately for us, Carol wouldn't let Morris mess with our song, but he did insist on renaming it. Our record, now titled Don't Leave, Just Stay, I'll Go, was showing up on all the sales charts, but there was something strange. What do you got, George? What are those figures? Skirfner sales data. Pat, there's something very peculiar here. These are the first week's sales of off the record's hits, according to Gerfner. Notice anything unusual? Such as? Look. All the sales are about the same. Two of the hits are exactly the same. 172,227. And two are the same as the first week sales for our song. 192,489. More than 20,000 music outlets in this country and millions of buyers. How could two records sell the same number both in their first week? We decided to pay a call on the president of the Gerfner Rating Service. Please. Thank you for seeing us, Mr. Gerfner. It's always a pleasure to meet with mathematicians. I see you have an abacus. Oh, yes, I know. But the doctor assured me that with the proper diet and medication, it should clear up in a few weeks. <laughs> Mr. Gerfner. Oh, please. Call me A.G. A.G.? Did you notice any patterns when you looked into the history of off the seven hit records? Well, perhaps I pulled the first three week sales here, here, and here. Remember, George, the first week sales are multiples of 10,131. Now look at the second week. If my mental arithmetic is correct, this one is a multiple of 10,131. And so is this one. I'll bet some of the rest of them are, too. That is extraordinary. Hey, G. How does it happen that you haven't come to notice these highly unlikely consistencies? Well, I'm sure you can appreciate, Mr. Frankly. My company tracks thousands of records each week, and we merely report what the store's computers tell our computer. In other words, GRS counts. Correct. We don't analyze. But what is the explanation that so many of the sales numbers are multiples of 10,131? Well, as I said, I'm not a numbers analyst, but you'd like my honest opinion? Very much so. Beats the pajamas out of me. No idea? None. Hey, G, can you break these sales out on a regional basis? Oh, my, yes. Well, we got this great, big, beautiful country of ours broken down into six sales zones. Now, let's just see exactly where all the sales are coming from. Oh, my, this can't be. What can't be? Well, look, my truck, my licorice, and you had 17 sales in the first week. What do you mean? You reported 172,227. I know, but when I look at the data, and the second record had 18 sales, the 19, twenty, seventeen again, 19 again, 21. Are you saying those are the real sales? Oh, I'm not saying it. The computer's saying it. Not only that, but they're all from the same zone and the same store. Flower Records, New York City. Well, how could GRS report these humongous sales? Pat, guess what you get? 
when you divide 172,227 by 10,131. George, this is no time for arithmetic problems. No, Pat, this is precisely the time for arithmetic. 17 and 182,358 divided by 10,131, the quotient is 18. What about 192,489 divided by 10,131? 19. Exactly. Your main computer multiplied the actual sales by a factor of 10,131. So that's where these inflated sales figures came from. I'm afraid not, Miss Tuesday. You see, if it multiplied one record sale by 10,131, then all record sales will be multiplied by the same factor. I'm afraid it's got to be something else. He's right, Pat. Let's go back to HQ, Pard. Thanks for your help, AG. I had a fun time. Thought we had the answer to the problem, George. Me too. Now, don't give up. We'll just have to keep at it. We'll get to the bottom of this. I know, I know. I just feel better if... If what? If, if George Jr. wasn't so listless. He just lies around. I think you're feeding him too much. I am not. What did he have for breakfast? Chili. Yuck! Maybe he slipped into a coma and lost the will to gerb. <laughs> Hi, Benny. Benny! You may have done it again. A comma. Uh, I said coma, George. No. What did you say all off the song titles had in common? I said they were all dumb. And you said they all used commas. Right. Two in each title. So what? Look here. Off the songs weren't the only ones that had this unusual sales curve. That's right. Two other companies had similar sales curves. Don't try to slap the rap out of my trap. You, me, we. Commas? Two commas in each. I see what you're getting at, George. Computers can't think. But they can be programmed to recognize patterns. And Morse Norris was a computer programmer before he got into the music business. So maybe he hacked into GRS. Broke into the system illegally? Right. He programmed their computer to pick up every song with two commas in its title, and multiplied its sales figures by 10,131. Then Morris Norris sends someone to Flower Records to buy 17 copies of every new off the release. The GRS computer multiplies 17 by 10,131 and reports sales of 172,227 and sales appear to soar. But sometimes the first week sales were higher than 172,227. Maybe a legitimate shopper or two just happened to buy the record as an impulse item or sometimes even bought more. But wait, how does Off make any bread on the deal? Maybe they just cheat the first two weeks. The song gets airplay because of big sales. Big appearing sales. Remember, they were phony. Right. But the DJ started pushing the songs, then people started to buy them for real. So the more the records moved up on the sales charts, the more the DJs played them. The more people heard them, the more they bought them. He appeared to have a hit, but then... He really did have one. That also explains why Opta only produced about a million and a half units per piece, even though GRS said that they had sold more than two million. Sure. Why make what you might not sell? What an ingenious scheme. What an illegal scheme. I've got an ingenious scheme of my own. Murray the Mouth? George Frankly, MathNet. How would you like to rid the music world of some of the scum that infests it? He says he can't quit. He doesn't know how to do anything else. Murray, we need your help. Can we count on you? He says he doubts it. He's never helped anyone before. Listen, Murray, this is what I want you to do. Friday, 11.47 a.m., and George had come up with a beauty plan. We slipped into our Google characters, and with Benny Pill as our manager, Colonel Parker Colonel, and Carol DeVilbis, we made our way to Why Me Radio and the live Murray the Mouth show and an appointment with destiny. Oh, come destiny? on, will you? An appointment destiny? with destiny? Destiny rides okay, again. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay.
All right, one of my all-time favorites, Please Smash In My Face, from that heavy metal supergroup, Crunch. Okay, rat faces, as I promised you right now, we have a very exclusive interview, Mr. Morris Norris, who is the brain who's behind the hottest record company in the whole stinking world, off the record. Welcome, Norris. Thank you, Murray. You sure have a way with a phrase. Well, who cares what you think, Morris? Thank you very much for insulting me. Well, you're going to uh, Cleveland, Ohio tonight, is that correct? Yes, I am. My colleagues are inducting me into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Where's that shame? <laughs> hey, here's a little surprise for you, Morris. Uh, your hottest new artists are right here in the studio to pay their respects to you. Always a pleasure to see the Googles. Hey, Googles. That oh, hey. Looks like we have a brand new release here. That's right, Maury. It just came out about one week ago. Well... Do you like this new one, Morris? You think it'll go multi-platinum like the others? Well, I, you know, you never can tell. Uh, Mr. Norris has been so busy with things, Murray. He hasn't really been following this new song as closely as he might. Right, Mr. Norris? Right. Can I see that? Sure. Yeah. You know, here's a real first on live radio, Morris. The new Gurfners are due out right now, and, uh, well, you are such a genius. I, I just wondered if you might care to predict what the first week's sales figures for Oh So Well might be. No, I'd rather not. Come on, Morris. I thought you were supposed to be a musical genius. Well, I am. I'm just not prepared. Other producers have made predictions on this show. Come on, Norris. Are you a genius, or are you nothing more than a flapdoodle filled fop? Hey, you can't call me that. Oh, why the heck not? Because I don't know what it means. I thought you were known as a chance taker, Morris. I am. Well, then take a chance. Take a chance. Make a, make a genius-like prediction. All right, all right. Good. In fact, why don't we all make a little guess while I play this tune? Good idea, Murray. Let's write our guesses down. Gerfner Rating Service, may I help you? Hey, Murray the Mouth here. Gerfner, listen. I want you to tell us the first week's sales figures for the record Oh So Whoa. But before we get to that, let me just ask my panel of experts what their guesses were. Morris Norris? I guessed 172,227. Gee, we all seem to be thinking as one. Okay, Gerfner, what was that figure? 172,000. 227. How could that be, Norris? How could we all have gotten the same answer? How oh, indeed. I don't suppose dumb luck would hold much more. So, Norris got flower records to stock his records. It was an automatic shipment. For every new release, an assistant automatically went out and bought 17 copies. The sale will be recorded in the Gerfner computer. Once in a while, a real customer would pick up a copy just by accident. That's why the first week's sales varied a little. The Gerfner computer multiplied by 10,131 for two weeks. Then it stopped as real sales took over. But where did you get that phony record that you played on Murray the Mouth's show? We recorded it with Carol last night. Then I got a graphic artist to dummy up a cover. We put two commas in the title and ran it across the Flower Records scanner 17 times. The Gerfner system did the rest. But if Norris didn't know anything about this song, why didn't he admit it? Well, his ego wouldn't let him appear stupid on live radio. <laughs> <laughs> Besides, he noticed two commas in the title. Figured he might luck out. Well, I just want to thank you for saving my career. I just got a job offer to head the A&R department with a new company. Would you Googles like to be my first artist? <laughs> I think our new numbers will all be done at MathNet. <laughs> oh, no. He's gone. Oh, no. The window's open. Oh, no. Didn't he seem a little despondent yesterday? He's killed himself. Look, he's left a suicide note. Thanks for your help. I've had an offer to do my own show in Hollywood. Catch me on The Rich and the Gerbils. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Morris Norris was tried in the county of Manhattan, in and for the state of New York. He was found guilty of a 190.65 scheme to defraud, 156.10 computer trespass, 175.10 falsifying business records, and a 3131.3 desecrating popular music. He is spending 17 years in rock and roll. He piles rocks and he eats rolls. It's a game show. It's a geography lesson. It's a mystery. Where in the world is Carmen Sandiego? Next at 5.30 on OPB.